Hello, BookTube. Well, what better day than President's Day to resume our presidential library series after a lapse of a very, very long time? Those of you who are new to the channel, hello, first of all, welcome. Uh, once upon a time, I started a regular series on this channel in which I talked about each U.S. president in terms of the books written about them, a little bit about them, and then uh, made some recommendations for books, you know, biographies, studies of their time, whatnot. Uh, and we did George Washington, uh, of whom I am no fan. <laughs> and then we did John Adams, uh, our country's first great president. Uh, and then we did Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it's a sign of how much the precise control of presidential library has slipped in my mind that I made two videos about Thomas Jefferson. I completely forgot that I made the first one. I made a second one. Uh, so Thomas Jefferson, to put it mildly, is done. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, that, then we stopped for a long time. And I, it, it's one of the things when I ask what you all want, you consistently say so. Uh, that and this, you always say you want this. <laughs> Who are those people being? Oh, who are they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd resume it. And why, what better day than President's Day to do that? Which and, and according to our very slow progression, we are now at the fourth President of the United States, James Madison, uh, who is in his own way just as famous as, as the first three. He was a, a chief architect of the the United States Constitution. He was a chief architect of the Bill of Rights. He was a chief architect uh, and writer of the Federalist Papers. He was a, 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 just a font of writing, of political writing and thinking. And it, I, I'll get this out of the way first, it's very lucky for the United States of America that it had people like James Madison. It's a miracle that the United States of America had two or three people like James Madison at the same time. But it's very lucky that a new nation had a thinker like him who could envision, okay, if we're going to make a new government and we're going to make it work in a way that the government we're breaking off from does not work, how would we do that? How would we go about doing that? Both conceptually and practically, how would we go about doing that? And that is amazing. If you read... Uh, the Constitution of the United States, the oldest Constitution in the world, if you that's still in practice. If you read uh, about it from a legal perspective, if you if you even uh, of course the Federalist Papers, they're they're studied in schools and they should be. Uh, but even the Bill of Rights is is amazing, not only for what it enshrines, but for what it doesn't enshrine. It's the whole thing. A huge chunk of all of that sprang from one person's mind, the mind of James Madison. Uh, it's not possible to praise him uh, uh, without qualification, because like Washington and like Jefferson, he was a slave owner, uh, a slave trafficker. He, uh, he, the, the, this, the stereotypical vision of him as being this disembodied intellectual figure who just lived off the profits of estates that were run by others and really didn't have any specific knowledge of what was going on in his name uh, is not true. It's not true in any case. It's a part of the myth of the American South, of the Grand Old South, and like all parts of that myth, it's a complete lie. The, there was no such thing as a disengaged and virtuous slave owner, and Madison certainly wasn't one. He he, he actively partook of the all the iniquities of the system, almost. <laughs> he didn't go quite as far as Thomas Jefferson. He didn't rape his slaves, um, and he didn't ever, like Washington, personally, physically beat them. He knew perfectly well, he was the smartest of the people that we're talking about, he, except for John Adams, but he knew perfectly well uh, that, I'm, I'm jerking all around here because Frida has gone from being adorable to trying to kill me. See, she is, she is trying to kill me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't like Jimmy Madison any more than I do. <laughs> but, uh, uh, he was certainly smart enough to know the iniquities that he was furthering. He was certainly smart enough to see the horrors that were part of a system that he did not did nothing to change. So you're a slave, you're working in the fields, your sons are working beside you, your daughters are working beside you, maybe your wife has a job in the kitchen, although when it's harvest time she's working in the field too, from before morning until after dark. And then, let's say your rheumatism, which you felt since you were 30, gets the best of you at 45, and you suddenly can't work as much. 
you, in most cases, I know it's the, the typical myth of the American South is that it, it happened in all cases that you would be retired to gentler work indoors. But in most cases, you were sold for mine work in the Southern Hemisphere. A death sentence. But not just a death sentence. A horrible death sentence. A horrible death sentence where you would be whipped to death or you would die of exhaustion or you would just be worked until your body simply broke. And you would be sold, you know, the, the sale happened during the day and it, it usually happened on plantation property, which means that your wife and your sons and your daughters could see it happen. They knew perfectly well what was happening. And, and if they tried to stop it, they themselves would be beaten or perhaps sold. It's an, an irredeemably ugly and horrible system, and everyone knew it at the time. There's no sense talking about historical relativism or historical hindsight. Plenty of people were decrying it at the time on exactly the terms that I'm using now. Not in the 2020 hindsight of saying that it was bad economically or would become so, but that it was a blight, a moral abomination. Uh, and Madison did it anyway. He didn't care. He didn't care as much as he cared about his own personal wealth. So, in that sense, like with Jefferson and like with Washington, we have to make a split between uh, the, the personal and the policy. And you're going to find, as we go through presidential library series, since I'm, I don't plan on abandoning it this time, that that often defines the two different kinds of presidents that the country has had. The, they're, on the one hand, personality presidents. On the other hand, the policy presidents. Sometimes the two are one, but very often not. Uh, and with Madison, once we note the horror of his personal life, the, the fact that he bought and sold human beings as slaves, uh, all the rest of it is policy, to a greater degree than almost any other president before or since. It, 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 it's, he was an unending process machine of policy papers and uh, political ruminations and tracts and philo philosophical treaties about what the nature of the experiment was that was happening, that he was helping, to that he was helping the American experiment to happen, and he was constantly writing about it in letters and in, in uh, all sorts of official documents for Virginia and for the country. An endless supply of them. Um, with almost nothing on the physical side. He, I mean, he, he married. There's a wonderful book uh, that about Dolly Madison that, that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, 20 years old now, I think, something like that. Uh, there's also, there have also been one or two good novels that featured... James Madison. Uh, uh, Larry Nevin, I think, did one called 1812 that's actually quite good. Well worth... I'll, I'll find all the information and put it down below. Uh, but when you're talking about James Madison as a president, you're mostly talking about his times, about the events in which he took place. It's not the same thing as, for instance, uh, you know, to use a, an egregious example of a personality president would be Theodore Roosevelt. It's not that kind of thing. Even when... Uh, when James Madison was an undergraduate uh, in New Jersey, <laughs> he was basically a non-entity. All he was was either excelling, grinding at school, or sick. He barely held on. Just a sickly person from the beginning of his life all the way to the end. So, really, when you want when you want to pick books to read about him, uh, full-scale, full-dress biographies tend to disappoint. Because they end up wandering into the weeds of procedure, which is where Madison spent most of his time. So he is ill-served by a normal biography. The, na the standard one is still Ralph Ketchum's book, which I will, I will list that down below. I don't have to show it to you because it's boring reading. Ketchum is not a boring writer at all. Uh, some of you will, will remember a book that he wrote about Valley Forge that's actually really, really good. And he wrote a bunch of other good things, too. But when it came to writing a 900-page biography of a man who was his documents... He was baffled, and it shows. It, it doesn't work. Um, so what I want to recommend for this presidential library series when we're talking about what to read about Madison is to read about his time. Read about those policies. Find a really good, long history of the Constitution, an examination of the drafting and the ratification of the Constitution. Madison will be all over that like a rash. But I have, I have a couple of other things here, too, that are a broader brush looks at the time Madison took the country to war, for instance, against Britain. Uh, and that was the War of 1812, which has been written about quite a bit, even though the standard refrain of everyone who writes about it 
uh, is that it hasn't been written about. <laughs> That's, that needs to go. That standard refrain needs to go. There isn't anybody that writes about the War of 1812 that doesn't open by saying it's a footnote that no one ever examines. Well, if that's true, then there shouldn't be hundreds of books about it, and there are. But I want to recommend one to you that is, oh, oh it is so good. Uh, this is George Dalton, and this is 1812. Uh, this is uh, a naval concentration, a concentration on the naval aspect of the war. But as you can tell from the size of it, it's broad. It, it's broad brush. It's not just the battles. It's it's uh, lots and lots of context. Lots and lots of the politics of the day. Lots and lots of the international questions involved. It's not just my beloved old Ironsides, <laughs> who is this is will of course be the she will be the star of a book like this. She's the star of any book like this. But there's a, it, this is not just that. This author is a terrific storyteller. Uh, and he's written, uh, I, I, I think he's written two other big books on the War of 1812. I recommend them all. Uh, this was the one that came to hand. I don't know that I have any of the others. It's terrible. Uh, but then these other two, I'm afraid they're huge because people write panoramic studies of, of uh, Madison's time. The first one is by Jay Winnick. We've seen both of them on this channel. This is The Great Upheaval, uh, which is the, the uh, first couple of decades of America's official life as a nation and also a large amount about the nation before then, about the, the colonies and whatnot. And Madison is all through here. Scarcely a page you can go without encountering him and, and uh, the impact that he had on all these events. People went to him, even very smart people, went to him to clarify their thinking or for him to write out their thinking. Uh, and this is... This is uh, Again, like Doggins' book, this is a really good narrative, in addition to being really informative. And then the last one uh, is huge. <laughs> it's by Daniel Walker Howe, and it's What God Hath Wrought. A big volume in the... Uh, this is the Oxford History of the American Peoples. They, they just do these huge volumes. And this is uh, largely the same. I mean, Madison is at the very at the beginning of this. He's all over the beginning of it. The story moves on from there until, you know, after his death to, to um, Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams and whatnot. But this will give you, uh, this is also extremely valuable when reading about Madison. He has a long shadow over the events that, that took place after he died. Uh, and you'll remember him in this book. You'll remember Jackson and, and John Quincy Adams more, but you'll still remember him. This is still really important. Uh, and there's one other big book that I don't have, could not find it. I might not own a copy. There's an enormous... Um, History of the American Whig Party. That has, again, Madison is all over the beginning of it. He's all over uh, the first chunk of pages. And it's done really well, and it's really informative, and it's really it really fills you in on the political side of Madison's life. He wrote, he, he was a political creature, uh, theorized about it constantly. Uh, and that that is the sum and total to say about him. I mean, he was an indifferent family man. He was uh, an indifferent, an indifferent friend. He was as close, uh, pretty much as close as the American president has, has ever come to a disembodied intellect in the office and in his life. Um, except for that, that the horrible feat of clay, which is that he wouldn't have been able to afford to do any of it without buying and selling other human beings as property. Uh, but aside from that, he did his best to drain the blood out of, out of his life. Uh, that might be another reason why I'm no great big fan of his. He's boring to read about, even though what he did was absolutely fundamental to this country in a way that can be said of very few other people that we will talk about in, uh, in this presidential library series. You could probably say it about the next president <laughs> as well. And we'll get to him. We'll, we'll, we'll go on from here. I will make this... I don't know that I want to set a timetable on it, but I will make this regular. So uh, at least once a month, uh, we will do another president. So we're done with Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and now Madison. And we will move on next time. So, so I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.